The name Merle is, it's a French word or a Breton word, and it actually relates to the word pearl. It's, it is made of calcium carbonate, the same material that pearls are made of. And it's, it's made by a living red alga, a red seaweed. But the reason it was thought to be coral in the past is because it looks like a coral. And they called it, that all the different kinds of corals were called something poorer because they have little holes where the little um, animal cells live, animal individuals. But in the case of Merle, they couldn't see those holes, so they called it nullipor, which means a coral with no holes. They couldn't understand why it had no holes, but it looks like a coral, and in many ways it behaves like a coral. We thought that there were two main species here, and the most common one is called phymatolithon, calcarium so the calcarium refers to the fact that it's calcified and it's like a stone lithon means like a stone and then we thought there was another one which is lithothamnion corallioides similar name litho meaning stones again and corallioides like a coral there are uh, there's a whole suite of, of seaweeds particularly small red algae that are pretty much confined to merle the merle is the only place they live and therefore, if the merle is damaged, those seaweeds will be damaged. Uh, why they like merle so much? Partly, it's the calcareous nature, so that they can actually put down the equivalent of their roots right into the merle, drill right down into it, and that, that allows them to be there during storms and everything. They can actually survive all kinds of events. But also, the little holes and crannies in the merle allow a wider range of small seaweeds to develop. There are uh, the several species that have been described from Merle, including a uh, seaweed called Gelidiella calcicola that I described. Calcicola means loving calcium. And now there is another green seaweed also called calcicola, which they got from uh, a Merle bed. So yes, species that are found only on Merle. And that's one of the things that's very exciting about Merle. The, the seasonality of Merle shows a lot of variation because uh, waves in winter, storms, they really disturb the Merle beds. They build them up into big waves and then uh, those waves move sometimes. You can actually have like a standing wave moving along and though, as those waves move along they will actually destroy a lot of the algae that are associated with the Merle bed. And then in the spring, when it all stabilizes again, those will grow up again. So the, the appearance of a Merle bed in winter and summer is quite distinct. So I've just picked up a handful of what we're standing on on this beach. The common popular name for these beaches is coral strands because the Merle does look like coral. Now, it's actually quite heavy when you pick it up. And the reason it's quite heavy is that these are old and actually it's like a fossil really and it's got much heavier over time. But in addition to the merle, you can see that there's shells in here, so it's, it's built in up with dead shells as well. But also the bedrock around here is granite and you can see that there are small granite pebbles and underwater those small granite pebbles are actually a special habitat for particular seaweeds that can only live on granite. They can't live on the calcareous material such as the merle. So that's one of the reasons that the merle beds here are so biodiverse is that there is heterogeneity differences even amongst a very small handful. And in fact when I was doing my PhD I just used to collect a beaker full and found that a beaker of the merle alive would have up to a hundred species of algae on it. So that, seeing the heterogeneous nature of it helps you to see how there can be so many different things living in a very small place. Merle is a very, they can be very long-lived uh, organisms. We can sort of compare them to the bristlecone pines of the sea. Bristlecone pines can live a thousand years and Merle can actually, we know because we did some radiocarbon dating and the individual Merle phallus, as we call it, the body, the individual Merle was over 200 years old. So they could be a lot older than that even because as they're kind of broken up 
they will regenerate very slowly, as I said, only a millimetre a year in each direction. So a large one, which might be, say, this big, perhaps hand-sized, could be two or three hundred years old. So that's the kind of, um, that makes them very exciting because they can actually keep a permanent record of the climate in them, just like tree rings. Uh, so the, the question of whether merle can act as a carbon sink and carbage, carbon storage is actually a very interesting one because clearly when the merle thalli, when the merle beds grow, they, put, they absorb carbon dioxide and they put it into calcium carbonate. So the, the body of the merle is full of, of carbon in the form of um, calcium carbonate. But is it actually a reservoir for carbon? Yes, it is. Uh, but it will only be an actual carbon sink if it becomes buried and put away over time. And in fact, that is exactly what happens with Merle. The beach that we're standing on here, each individual was probably alive more than 8,000 years ago. So actually, the, the carbon that it captured 8,000 years ago had still trapped in this uh, calcium carbonate nodules. And they can also be washed into deep water and they can be buried. And in fact, you can even find merle beds buried on the land and using radio, radiocarbon dating, you can see that those maybe were 10,000 or more years old. So these subfossil beds have clearly captured carbon. But when they break down, they release that carbon again. So you could say it kind of is slowing down the amount of increase of carbon in the atmosphere. I dived very extensively in Kirkiran Bay, which is a major bay system to the north of here. And Kirkiran Bay is an area which has um, a very strong current regime. During spring tides, uh, the current reaches about two and a half knots. And that, in this uh, fact, uh, is um, facilitating many animals because currents generally means a good food supply, uh, high oxygenation in the water, and uh, keeping uh, all the rock surfaces and everything clean of debris and so on, which uh, is what most uh, epifaunal animals really, really want. But again, the uh, male has many uh, facets, and um, we, as we here see on the beach, uh, a lot of it is basically simply dead debris, and the dead debris has its own set of um, animals, uh, they like it because they can burrow in it. Uh, I would like to mention one particular animal, a sea cucumber, holoturian is the um, technical term, which lives very, in very high numbers in Kirkiran Bay. The Latin name for it is uh, Neopentadactyla mixta. Unfortunately, it has no common name. And this animal lives uh, in, the, uh, in uh, dunes of uh, male debris. These dunes reach a height of about uh, six feet and uh, can change basically between tides to tide because the material is so highly uh, transportable by currents. And uh, they're living there, this is uh, a fairly large animal, about 30 centimeter long when fully expanded. It lives U-shaped in the sediment and they're about uh, 300 per square meter of those. So if you go diving on those dunes, you have uh, basically just a sea of tentacles waving in the, uh, into the current. It's a strange animal because it likes to go to sleep early in the morning, so around uh, 8, 9 o'clock, goes into the sediment for uh, a couple of hours, and then they all come out again. We don't know why. Um, many other animals in the, um, uh, living in the, uh, uh, the sediment you know, live there because it's easily, it is well oxygenated and they can uh, burrow fairly easily. A lot of animals living actually in the ground up to a depth of two feet and deeper. We uh, did some research on that with a suction sampler, which uh, was able to dig uh, uh, as deep in the sediment as we, would, uh, as we wanted. And uh, a lot of animals uh, said uh, lived down to about uh, two, um, two feet or 60 centimeters or deeper, which means that uh, nowadays with modern, uh, the modern um, crabs and so on, you simply uh, don't get those. And uh, I became interested in small encrusting uh, forms of uh, epifauna, bryozoans, sponges, and so on. And I did some um, research and collections of the, uh, specifically of this material. 
and some of the species, the, the species uh, found of uh, sponges and of um, bryozoans or sea mats, uh, I did not find uh, anywhere else. Which doesn't mean that they are not there, because uh, you would have uh, to need a breeding population. But I did not uh, record them, but I recorded them regularly on MEL. Uh, sponges basically uh, require a solid surface to settle on, at least to start life, life on. And uh, some of them can start life on very small stones. Uh, in the deep sea, I have seen them settling on individual uh, foraminiferent shells, uh, little sticks and so on. Uh, and uh, the number, I got a number of uh, species on MEL, actually, which normally I do associate with uh, deeper water. And uh, uh, I have not found them on uh, pieces of debris or stone other than, than uh, MEL. Some of those sponges are very small. They're basically just a little hairy patch, uh, which you see under the microscope. Um, they don't have a common name. And in order to identify them, you, you boil them in a little bit of um, hydrochloride or nitric acid on the slide and uh, cover them with a cover slip in some mounting medium. And then you can study them, measure them, and identify them properly. Um, there's a couple of uh, bryozoans, again, which uh, I have not found anywhere else. And I also found uh, a couple of um, brachio species or brachiopods, small species, uh, which I have not found anywhere else. Which does not mean that they are not any uh, that they they don't grow elsewhere. They have been found in other environments, in not as necessarily associated with lithotamium, but in Kerkurum Bay, uh, lithotamium was the only substrate I found them on. Uh, we are here at a, uh, the Golby location in particular. We are here at a crossroads. We are at a uh, at a kind of a melting pot of uh, boreal fauna, which is, means northern fauna, and Lusitanian fauna, which is kind of southern fauna from the Mediterranean and up. That's why the area here is so extraordinarily species rich. There were actually um, trials in the, uh, in the 70s to harvest the Edamel in Kekeren Bay. In other words, come with a, a, a long a digger or bagger or whatever and uh, remove large things because it has the reputation of being a very good uh, fertilizer on particular an acid soil because it is so rich in minerals and uh, trace minerals. But uh, that never, uh, it never happened uh, and that is a good thing. But uh, it was uh, seriously uh, kind of contemplated as a, uh, a, a natural resource to be exploited. And uh, it would be a pity because obviously with the uh, fauna you remove uh, with the male, you remove a lot of the epifauna, infauna, and so on, and you would sev uh, severely diminish uh, a unique habitat which Kekurun Bay is. I'm Juliet Brody and I am a professor at the Natural History Museum and my full-time position is to study seaweeds so I research into various different sorts of seaweeds. Um, I've worked on mainly reds but increasingly on large brown seaweeds and I'm also very interested in calcified red seaweeds particularly in relation to ocean acidification and what might happen to them in the longer term as we see these large increases in carbon dioxide coupled with the effects of other climate change. Merle belongs to a group of red seaweeds which we call the coralline alines and they're called that because they're calcified so they have carbon um, in their skeleton if you like so they're sort of covered in a carbonate skeleton and there are different sorts of coralline algae. So for example on the shore and in rock pools you will see sorts which sort of stick up really. They like little fans or little fronds but if you look in rock pools you'll find that rock pools are covered in paint, pink paint and those are calcified seaweeds as well. But some of these calcified seaweeds will form what we call rhodoliths which are like spiky balls of calcified material that are red seaweeds, they're photosynthesizing. 
Now, what is happening with the increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, our seas are becoming more acid. And as a consequence of that, these skeletons are being compromised. So it's a bit like if you imagine putting an eggshell in something like vinegar or, or lemon juice, some sort of an acid, they'll start to disintegrate or they'll start to break down. And what we think will happen over the next hundred years, if all the predictions are correct, is that we will start to see our mole beds disappearing in the northeast Atlantic, particularly up in the north of this part of the world, um, where you've got sort of cooler waters. So these effects are more marked. Further south, much further south, they may be okay. But as the waters become more acid and the carbonate saturation um, line moves further south, then that's when we might start to see these mole beds disappearing. In June, about a year ago, a group of us, about 28 of us, got together in Plymouth at the Marine Biological Association to, to try to predict what we thought would happen to a whole range of benthic organisms in the sea, particularly the, those organisms that form habitats. So, for example, the kelp forests and the seagrass beds and the mole beds. And we tried to look at all the evidence that was available and predict what might happen in the year 2100 to the mole beds, to the kelp forests. And in the case of the mole beds, we do predict that they will begin to disappear in the most northerly regions. And that that habitat may, may disappear and may be replaced with other more fleshy algae and possibly replaced with non-native species that will be able to come in and occupy those niches. In other hand, in Brazil, there's like thousands of kilometers of the Brazilian coast covered by rhodolith beds. So when I say the word taxonomy, I'm referring to the kind of tools that we are using to, to name and to, to describe a species. So in the past, the phycologists used to look at the morphology and describe the species for coral in algae. But now with the DNA analysis, we are discovering that the diversity of the species is much higher. So we need to describe and we need to use different names than the ones that they were used before. I have the chance to attend this conference the last year in Spain. So many people from Scotland, Ireland, Europe in France and other parts in Brazil, and many people from Mexico attend this conference. And it was a big collaborative effort to understand the, all the processes that are happening in the rolling beds. So the processes in the marine uh, domain is, is quite complex. The Pacific, the, the Pacific Ocean is completely different to the Atlantic. And in general, we can say that the, the ecosystem, as, like the rolling belts, is a, a global ecosystem. And in general, they work like a same unit. But in particular areas, they can provide the calcium carbonate, they can uh, support a huge diversity of fishes for uh, commercial interest and also for the production of uh, other kind of products, uh, chemical compounds for, me for medicines and uh, these kind of mar marine habitats are very important for the conservation of the marine life. Carbonate, um, magnesium calcium ratio changes due to warming so you find that there's summer winter variation seasonality and also it changes as well due to the uh, ocean acidification so that will have an effect on the material properties like the hardness just from the structure alone we see that there is weakening of the skeleton which suggests that there may be um, it will be harder for male in the future to support high level biodiversity because they are structurally and functionally complex My name's Chris Williamson. Um, I'm a third year PhD student based at the Natural History Museum in London and I also work for Cardiff University and Bristol University and my project is basically examining the impacts of ocean acidification on calcifying macroalgae uh, which is quite a broad subject area 
and I work with a particular group of algae called Coralina, a genre, genus called Coralina. Um, and these are turfing macroalgae that you find all over the northeast Atlantic and quite a lot in different temperate regions. Um, very ecologically important. They're considered ecosystem engineers because they build habitat and they're sort of a nursery habitat for lots of invertebrate species. And because of their physical structure, they're quite hardy against intertidal stresses. Um, but also because of the fact that they're calcified, then they're quite vulnerable to ocean acidification. Um, the impacts of climate change for all algal species is a temperature shift. Um, so you're getting increasing sea surface temperatures, and because algae or all marine animals live within a certain temperature niche, that you know can push the species either more towards the poles or you know away from the tropics as temperatures increase, and that affects all algae. Um, the impacts of ocean acidification for coralline macroalgae. Uh, really twofold. So the, the two negative aspects of ocean acidification is that you have increasing acidity and you have decreasing concentration of carbonate ions. So on the first hand with the increasing acidity that increases the, the solution pressure on the species and um, on their skeleton and the decreasing concentration of carbonate ions that's removing the building blocks that they need to make the skeletons in the first place. Um, so it's predicted that essentially they'll find it much harder to grow and to keep their strength and their structure um, in the future when the oceans acidify, so we might lose them. I'm Jason Hall Spencer, and I'm a professor of marine biology uh, at the University of Plymouth, which is in the southwest of um, the UK. Well, mill is a, a is a seaweed. Actually, um, it requires light to photosynthesize, like all of its other um, uh, seaweed relatives. But unlike seaweeds, it's not floppy and slimy uh, like kelp or, or racks on the seashore. It's actually got a very very hard skeleton. I've brought one of my favourite uh, examples of this uh, with me. It's you know, quite a big lump, and it's hard. And you can see why um, people used to think it was it was coral because it certainly looks a lot like coral. It's um, a hard skeleton. It, it lives in the shallow waters um, of, of of the planet and uh, makes up quite strong reefs of calcium carbonate. Now, quite a long time ago, uh, people realised that it was actually, actually could photosynthesise and grow in the light, and it's got these these um, pigments that make it look pink, um, that mask the actual chlorophyll that it uses, and it's actually got green chlorophyll within it as well. We, you know that if you grind it up um, in alcohol, you see the, the green um, pigments come out. It's definitely a plant, um, but it grows very, very slowly like corals do. So um, that's where the confusion came from, but we now we know for sure that it is a, um, a type of seaweed with a calcareous skeleton uh, that forms reefs that build up very, very slowly um, with intricate holes within them that other organisms can live in amongst and hide from their predators. For biogenic reefs, the bio part means it's made by an animal. So unlike a rocky reef or some other hazard to, um, to maritime traffic, it is made up of organisms. That's the bio bit, biology. And, and the reef um, means it's changed the seabed characteristics and built up above the seabed to form something that shallows the water above it, hence the term reef. So biogenic reef means um, a reef built by a biological organism. Now the most famous of those are coral reefs, of course, but we can also get in um, the cold waters of the Northeast Atlantic reefs that are made by other things. I'm thinking things like um, mussel beds. Um, they form uh, reefs on the seafloor that completely change the nature of the seafloor because of the presence of the, of the mussels there. And there are other organisms that hide in amongst that reef and take advantage of the fact that they can get protection from the biogenic reef. We also, interestingly, have deep sea coral reefs in the Northeast Atlantic in permanently dark waters down at a thousand metres depth off Ireland. And these are biogenic reefs as well, building up off the seafloor over, over thousands of years to form hard substrata on the seafloor. Now, in the shallow waters uh, where photosynthesis can occur, you can get these biogenic reefs made up of 
uh, merle, this, uh, this, this car hard calcareous seaweed. And where that happens, it's fantastic because you get these beautiful uh, reefs in shallow water that are home to a really wide diversity, both of seaweeds and um, invertebrates and fish as well. And the, probably the most important thing as far as humans are concerned is that they are nursery areas for important species of bivalves. I'm thinking scallops mainly, but also oysters and, and mussels can live in amongst the, the niches within the merle and grow up to a sufficient size that when they, they leave that merle bed, they can protect themselves. These tiny scallops or oysters are very, very vulnerable to predation by crabs and starfish and other things that crawl around the seabed looking for food. Now, if they, they, we actually found that the heart rates of scallops slow down when they're in amongst the merle habitat and they speed up because they're, they're concerned about predation and uh, outside the merle habitat. And that's really fascinating. So these organisms know that these are safe havens. They're actually attracted to settle in these, in these merle habitats because merle emits a substance that triggers the settlement of many of these um, juvenile bivalves. So you get this um, hotel for invertebrates, basically. There's lots of little nooks and crannies in amongst the, in the merle that allows these organisms to develop uh, through their juvenile stages in a protected habitat so that by the time they're, they're larger and able to protect themselves with their shells, they um, are more robust. And what we see is preferential settlement of a variety of these organisms into the merle bed, and then as they grow, they recruit and spill over to habitats adjacent to them. So they're critically important as, as nursery areas. And they're also used for the feeding and the breeding and the hiding of juvenile fish. We've done some experiments at, on merle beds in Scotland and in Brittany, and even down in, in, in Spain and into the Mediterranean. We find that juvenile fish are attracted to these habitats because of the abundance of um, small prey items that they can fit in their small mouths. So they're nursery areas for a range of commercially important species of fish, including cod um, and pollock and bib and, and things like that. So um, it makes sense to protect these habitats, I think, because of their important um, to the commercial uh, aspects of what we do in terms of collecting food. They trigger the settlement of bivalves and they provide havens for the growth of a range of uh, commercially important species of fish. We've realised that merle requires quite a specific set of conditions. It needs, for example, clean um, oceanic waters. You don't find it in places like the Baltic or the North Sea or even, the, even parts of the um, Western English Channel because the water is either too turbid there or maybe the, the conditions have got too much variation in the salinity of the water. Nevertheless, we know that they, they like living on the west coasts. So places like Brittany and France or the west coast of um, Ireland, the very southwest tip of, um, of the UK, um, in Cornwall and up, in, and up in, in the west coast of Scotland. Something else it seems to like uh, and thrive living in amongst is, is areas where there's strong water flow at the seabed. And that's not surprising, really, if you consider the fact they're very slow growing plants. They require light uh, to grow. And if they were to get covered up in silt or sand or sediment, that would quickly kill them because they, they, you know, they require that light to survive. OK, they might survive uh, um, weeks or months buried in sand, but eventually they need to, to um, be exposed to the light that comes down through the water column. And for that to happen, you need areas that are current swept. They don't seem to like living in very, very exposed areas because that can mobilize the seabed and cause the burial of this material. Although recently, actually, we've been finding them living on the open coasts of Cornwall. So perhaps they don't necessarily need very, very sheltered um, conditions, but they certainly need water flow on the seabed. One of the most fundamental ways in which human beings can damage mill beds is by digging them up, removing them from the seafloor and then and using that material as a fertilizer or a soil conditioner on land. Um, it's also used to make graveyards look pretty and so forth, because it is a beautiful material. Um, pink when alive and, and a nice white color when dead, and it's intrinsically attractive. People like to pick it up and play with it. I've, I've been on beaches with children who are just fascinated by this stuff because it does look so nice. It's, it's a pretty material. But unfortunately, of course, the, this material builds up over thousands of years, and if you dig it up, it won't come back well, certainly not on timescales that are relevant to mankind. It might come back over thousands and thousands of years, but if you've dug, dug it up, it's a bit like digging up peat on land. Um, that, that habitat does not come back quickly. Now, there, there are deposits of this merle material, this, this, this gravel that's dominated by coralline algae, 
off um, parts of Brittany that are tens of metres thick, and they've been digging this up for, for decades um, because of, there's a large resource there. Um, unfortunately now, that means those mill beds uh, don't have the living layer of uh, material that the habitat re re relies upon, so that is now a, what's considered a fossil deposit of mill, because what's left is the material that was laid down in, in you know, many centuries ago, thousands of years ago, and that will not regenerate, and that's used um, by the French on land. And I understand that off um, Bantry in Ireland, there's also dredging that goes on there to remove the material. In the UK, we decided about 10 or 15 years ago that this was um, a completely unsustainable way of using the seabed because you're removing material that takes uh, thousands of years to accumulate. So it's now banned in the UK. Um, off Falmouth, there were, was a small company called Cornish Calcified Seaweeds that did remove this material uh, and sold it as a soil conditioner, but that, that, that practice has now been stopped. Now, since that, that ban was in place, the Falmouth Harbour Commissioner has um, been putting forward proposals to dredge the, the channel in the approaches to Falmouth Harbour so that very large um, tourist vessels can get in. At the moment, uh, the channel isn't wide or deep enough. Now, unfortunately for them, the, the channel that they want to uh, dredge is uh, populated by merle. So an experiment was undertaken whereby parts of that merle bed were picked up and moved to see what would happen uh, to the recovery of that merle bed um, after it had been moved. Because one proposal was to remove the merle that's lying on the surface of the, of the proposed um, dredging area, dredge it to the depth required for the ships to come in and out of Falmouth, and then to relay that uh, merle material on the sea floor because it's known to be of such um, conservation interest. And even dead merle is, is, a, is, a, um, is a type of habitat that has a much higher diversity and abundance of organisms than other sediment types. So that, that's where this experiment um, came in. Now, what it found was that when the merle is picked up and put back on the sea floor, um, that small organisms like amphipods and polychaetes do quite quickly recolonize those patches of merle that have been relayed on the sea floor which is, you might think is great, That's, that means um, maybe this, this can go ahead. But I argue that that, that would be um, a dangerous route to go down if you want the seabed to be the same as it was previously. The reason for that is, of course, organisms will quickly colonise small patches of mill that have been moved from the surrounding area, but that doesn't really scale up to the size of the area that's intended to be dredged. They're talking about dredging a very large area indeed, so therefore recolonisation from the edges of that into the mill would be slower. Uh, because there's less edge to colonise from. But what I'm most concerned about in this, in this case is that there is living merle in the area that's um, proposed to be dredged, and that's killed when you pick it up um, and move it in the way they did in that experiment. And also because all, many of the organisms that live in merle beds are long-lived, um, 50 years in, in some cases, and that their recolonisation will take at least 50 years uh, to take place. You can't expect... Um, the organisms that take that long to, to, um, to grow and mature on, on a, on a mill bed that hasn't been translocated uh, to suddenly come back, that, that just will not happen. So the recovery rates, even if um, the dredged area doesn't fill up with silt, which it might uh, once it's been lowered in the channel of an estuary, um, if, if that doesn't happen, um, the organisms that live in that mill bed might take a very, very long time to, to come back. And that's of importance commercially. As I've said, these male habitats are the feeding and breeding areas of commercially important species of, of fish and also broodstock areas for, for commercially important species of bivalve. So um, dredging and moving and putting back a male bed has never been done before, and I think it would, um, would be to the detriment of the habitat. Now, OK, over millennia, that, that, that would be expected to fix itself, but over the, the, the timescales that are relevant to the people who live in Falmouth, I think that would be destroying a habitat for which the area of Falmouth is, is famous and a special areas of conservation have been put in place. So there we go. I, if, if, if they are going to uh, remove and replace that habitat, I think they have to put up their hands to the public and say, we did this knowing that um, habitat destruction was likely to occur. Well, I've, I've been charged with looking at various um, impacts of human beings on, on male habitats. 
And one of the most pervasive of all is actually um, fishing with heavy demersal, that means seabed um, equipment. So types of equipment that's dragged across the seafloor causes a lot of damage because it um, rakes through the sea, the sea floor. Now I've heard people say and think that maybe raking the seafloor is good for it, like ploughing a field breathes life into the, into the soil, oxygenates the soil, turns it over and allows uh, the crops that you want to thrive. And that, that can be the case actually. You can uh, encourage the growth of organisms that you do want, for example scallops, um, have got such, such strong shells when they're big enough that they can pass through a scallop dredge um, when they're about this big, I suppose, and then carry on to grow up to what's this about this size. Um, and so the scallop fishermen think that dredging the seafloor with these, uh, with these, um, these scallop breaks is, is good for the seabed because scallops can thrive. Unfortunately, though, there are other organisms on the seafloor that don't thrive when they're dragged through with this heavy um, equipment. A merle is one of them. The merle is crushed because it's, um, it's got this delicate um, structure. These, uh, these twiglets are very easy to, to crush. You can crush them in your hand and you end up with a, with a powdery gravel. That, those rakes pulverise the seabed and they also, probably more important, bury uh, the material that the, the habitat relies upon. Um, it needs this surface layer, this veneer of uh, living material to grow and thrive. We know from experiments all over Europe now that heavy demersal fishing equipment, and it's not just scallop dredges, it's other types of gear that's dragged across the seafloor, cause, causes lots of damage to these male habitats. I was asked um, by Scottish Natural Heritage whether their policy of moving fish farms from areas with very, very sheltered conditions into areas with much more strong tidal flow would be a good idea. Um, this was they, they wanted to do this based on the evidence that fish farms in very sheltered conditions caused the seabed to change quite dramatically because the um, uneaten food and the faeces from the fish, from salmon uh, predominantly, builds up on the seafloor and makes it go anoxic because as that food and faeces starts to rot in shelter conditions, um, it uses up oxygen on the seafloor, killing organisms which would uh, normally um, live there. So they had this evidence and they thought, well, maybe it'd be a really good idea to move fish farms away from these very sheltered conditions, where anoxia at the seafloor is a problem, into areas with much stronger tidal flow, for example, above merl beds, which occur around Shetland and Orkney and up, and through, up through the, the Outer Hebrides, in places where they, that, which are sheltered but have strong um, flow on the seafloor, which you'd think would be perfect for, for salmon farms. Salmon need uh, a good flushing of um, highly oxygenated water. Now their models, they had some models um, that predicted that the food and the faeces that were uneaten from the fish farms would land on the sea floor um, but be moved quite quickly away uh, by strong tidal flows and they wanted me to check whether those models were right. So I went to un diving underneath fish farms in, in South Uist, up in Orkney and in the Shetlands to see if this was true and unfortunately the models were wrong. The models were designed for use on seabed types that are muddy, not for seabed types that are gravelly. Now what we found actually happens in real life underneath the fish farms is that the food and the faeces falling down from the, from the farm um, enter into the matrix of the gravel below and when the tide picks up, when tidal flow picks up um, out of slack water periods, that food and faeces is not flushed away, which they expected, but remains rotting within the mill matrix. And as the oxygen levels plummet in the mill matrix, as this organic material rots, that kills the mill. So this is a really bad idea, and I've told Scottish Natural Heritage this, because you cause long-term damage to seabed habitats if you put fish farms above mill beds. Now this isn't controversial, I mean it's, it's very very clear from all of the places we looked at fish farms on whale beds that this happens in every single instance. So this, the, the evidence for this is irrefutable. So I'm firmly of the opinion that putting a fish farm above a male bed, uh, a living male bed with this, uh, with this, um, that, the, the veneer of, of light material above it is a, a crazy idea because those habitats take thousands of years to build up but only months uh, to, to kill off if fish farms are put above them. In, um, in, in Galway Bay in particular, there's been a lot of debate um, uh, about whether there should be a salmon farm located. Um, 
what would you, your recommendations be? Like, would you? Well, I'd, I'd need to see the details of this um, salmon farm pr proposal, and it would be nice to see film of the seafloor, or um, even better, some evidence of what lives in a, in the mill there, um, in in the proposed site. Um, but just shooting from the hip and going from my experience of what what fish farming does. Um, in other male habitats up and down the coast of the British Isles, what we find is that certainly in Scotland, the, the fish farms cause um, untold damage to, to those male beds, and it's not, in my opinion, wouldn't be recommended. I have dived underneath very extensive mussel farms down off Bantry Bay and in um, Galicia, in, in the, in the um, Atlantic coast of Spain, whereby you see actually that they, the seafloor can continue to thrive and survive, albeit in a slightly changed way, um, when those mussel uh, farms are above them. And I think the main reason for that is, is they don't put so much organic material onto the seafloor. The mussels do filter the water and produce faeces that, that settle down on the seafloor, but they're not as organically rich as the waste food and faeces from salmon. And so that doesn't cause this big problem of rotting in amongst the mill on the, on the seabed. So I think in some instances that there might be a case uh, for situating mussel farms in a sensible way um, near or above uh, mill beds, but you'd have to tread carefully and monitor the situation and make sure you weren't killing the mill. But I don't see how um, a salmon farm could be situated safely above a mill bed without causing damage to it. My name is Yvonne Leahy, I work with the uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, which is affiliated with the Department of Arts, Heritage and the Gaeldacht. And um, our job is biodiversity, the conservation of biodiversity within Ireland. And through this we have, um, we look after all of the terrestrial um, and coastal up to the offshore sites. Within Ireland we protect it under the SACs, under the Habitats Directive. Um, we have special areas of conservation in the marine environment and on terrestrial land. But in the marine environment, merl is protected as what we call a, a keystone species. It is, forms by its nature, it forms a habitat that is different from what is around. And so therefore it attracts different variety of spe species. Um, and because it's a structure forming species, um, it has afforded more protection. So we don't allow... Um, anything that would destroy it or anything that would have deleterious effects on it to occur within its area. It is protected because we f have found over the years that they represent biodiversity hotspots. So where you get merle, you get an increase in the number of species that live there. And in often times they are endemic to that area or endemic to merle beds in particular, or they're very rare within a system. So for those reasons, it has been considered um, a protected species and also it has been exploited um, it has been used in the continent for um, as a fertilizer for land um, and used in various different ways so it has been exploited and because it's a long living species and slow to regenerate um, and slow to come back after any um, catastrophic event um, it, it has afforded more protection in 2000 and to 2010 we've mapped mainly zostra and merle. Zostra is a seagrass and um, subtitly we've uh, ident uh, identified the beds across the country and we have mapped these, mapped their extent and their quality um, and we have also under that same um, program mapped the merle beds again uh, in terms of their quality and their extent. Other um, sensitive species that we've covered under that would be Virgularia, which is um, a sea pen, um, which would be uh, occurring in soft ground. We've mapped it in Kinmare Bay. Um, they went out um, using diver surveys along transects, and along this transect they would have mapped um, the conspicuous species they saw. They would have also mapped the quality. Um, so they would have given a percentage of living to dead merle. Um, where possible, they would have identified the merle because I think it's quite um, difficult to uh, identify merle species in the field. 
they would have given uh, an idea of extent, so they would have mapped it as it petered out into the surrounding sediment. Um, and they would have covered most of the bays along the western seaboard. Some of the bays were initially done by um, acoustic survey, as in Roaring Water, um, Clue Bay, um, Kilkiran Bay. But it's very hard on the acoustic survey to distinguish marl from coarse sediment. But they would have used that initial um, survey to define their diving areas. Plus they would have, from local knowledge, um, used that information also to define the beds. Um, but what we have used has always gone back to the, their diving survey. Uh, that has been the most um, definitive version of it. What we have found is with every marl bed we have looked at, there is something unique about it. In Roaring Water, there's uh, a, a rare red algae that occurs with it. Um, also in Roaring Water, we have found three species of marl that occur together, which is very rare. Um, in in Kilkiran Bay, there's it's the same thing. We find little species that are either rare or in terms of distribution, they're reaching their limits in distribution. Um, in so for every bay we have found and we've looked at the merl in it, there is some unique feature to that bay um, in terms of the species that, that the merl holds. Merl is particularly uh, susceptible to substrate loss. It is, um, as I said, it's a plant, so therefore turbidity in the water is, is another thing which would cause it pressure. Um, and any eutrophication, um, um, degradation of the water quality. So all of these would be um, threats to the marl. So where we get aquaculture, fisheries, um, w waste water going into a bay, any of these would be considered threats to marl. Um, because again, we afforded um, particular protection because of its structure forming nature, we um, have asked that there be no go areas within marl where we get marl beds. So no aquaculture activity or fishing activity occurs over marl or zostra beds. Um, and so this affords them protection. And there is a buffer zone also around that, which w there would be no um, disimprovement and they would not be susceptible to any activity. Because if you trawl next to a marl bed, um, all the sediment can go over the marl bed and that would you know, smother cer certain species um, and certainly smother the bed, um, which would um, reduce its quality. By the EU Habitats Directive, um, which we designate SACs, the marl beds are protected at the moment um, and will be for future generations. And what we have put in place there is we recognise that there are structure forming species and we have given them importance. And we have designated that there's, there can be no activity that would be detrimental to their um, continuing quality in these areas. So their quality and their extent will be conserved within those SACs. I think the uniqueness of Merle is a feature. It has been lost in other countries and it is recognised by OSPAR that it has been lost in other countries. And what we have in Ireland is a very unique and very um, extensive range of Merle beds from the north right down to the south of the Atlantic coast. Um, and we should value them and protect them as we are doing and enjoy them. Tommy Fury and I'm the section manager of advanced mapping services here in the Marine Institute. Uh, we're part of the Inframar program which is jointly run between the Marine Institute and the Geological Survey of Ireland. It's, uh, it's, it's one of the biggest marine mapping programs in the world uh, and we've been going since 2007 with a previous program prior to that called the Irish National Seabed Survey. We use a variety of vessels and other survey instrumentation including aircraft and satellites to map the marine area of Ireland. Uh, we started out with a deep offshore economic exclusive zone mapping program called the Irish National Seabed Survey to define the marine territory, uh, the marine area of Ireland effectively. Since then, in the last few years, since 07, we've been working uh, in the nearshore coastal areas uh, under the Inframar program 
to map uh, initially in the first 10 years of the program 26 bays and three coastal priority areas. The sort of thing we're doing is looking at the the physical uh, type of seabed, the water depth of the seabed using various different types of technology. Uh, we can identify whether it's sand, gravel, mud, uh, how, how deep the water is is critical, particularly in ports and harbours for shipping. The type of sediment on the seabed is critical. Uh, it gives you information on the type of habitat, the type of creatures that live there. From a fisheries management pr perspective, for example, this is hugely important. It's also valuable from a conservation perspective. There's lots of sensitive species uh, growing in the, uh, the coastal area of Ireland on the seabed, uh, and there's all sorts of ecosystem development on the back of that. We need satellites to give us our position, so we use satellite navigation. Very, very accurate positioning is required for the, the type of technology we use for, for mapping the seabed. We have geophysical tools as well, so bottom profilers, which gives you a profile vertically into the sediment uh, it gives you an idea of the thickness of sediment cover that's there. That's very important for engineering purposes. If you want to put a cable or build infrastructure, you need to know what the sort of sediment overburden is on top of the rock. We use uh, multi-beam sonar technology. This is the acoustic tool, our primary tool. It's something that gives you a very advanced three-dimensional map of the seabed, the actual shape of the seabed uh, from which we can derive the water depth. Uh, it also gives you information on the the energy of sound that returns from the bottom of the ship, gives you information on the hardness of the seabed. So we can get information on whether it's a sand, a mud, a gravel or a bedrock. There's a lot of uh, very, very advanced data processing technologies we can apply on the back of the, the survey data we require to, to determine what, what we're actually looking at. We can process this information and derive seabed classification maps. And again, these are very useful. It gives you an idea of the, the, the sediment distribution or the, the rock distribution, which again, from a habitat point of view, is, is critical to know. If you want to manage your marine space, you have to know what's there, uh, what areas to protect so you don't impact on your fisheries, uh, so you don't dump a dredge spoil, for example, on a herring spawning ground. Uh, so we had a situation a year ago where we were able to provide the habitat mapping information to the decision makers in government to help them to, to di dictate where to, to, do to dump dredge spoil. The programme we worked on last year uh, called Mesh Atlantic was about mapping European seabed habitats uh, and in the Atlantic area. Um, and, and what we've established is that there is no agreed uh, single methodology or approach to develop a product in relation to a habitat mapping product. Uh, it depends on the user's requirement. If you want to make a decision on where you develop an aquaculture site, you have a very different need to somebody who wants to uh, protect a cetacean species like our bottlenose dolphin in the Shannon Estuary. So the habitat map is something that will be defined based on the user, user need or user requirement. Uh, it, in terms of generating habitat maps, traditionally we relied on acoustic uh, analysis. So we took our acoustic data and we ran it through a software called Quester Tangent, which did a multivariate statistical analysis of the data. So every single one of the 512 acoustic beams per tenth of a second that we transmit from the ship is analyzed. <laughs> it sounds a bit complicated, but we analyzed the acoustic uh, nature of, of, of the signal. Uh, and it depends on what it bounces off on the seabed as to how strong it comes back, the amplitude of the physical signal, uh, at, but also the, the texture of the seabed, uh, the size of the grains, the variability within the grain size will all add to different physical parameters that you'll see in each acoustic signal. When you put these together uh, and effectively put them into a computer software package and process them, we were, we were automatically able to derive uh, what we would call on ground, on, on ground truth classification maps. So uh, we would then take physical samples to, to determine what that specific class was. Um, the other thing we've started to do in more recent years is effectively take the backscatter data and the shaded relief imagery where we're physically able to see the rock uh, sediment uh, boundary more clearly than you can in an automated way. Uh, you need a, a level of human interaction there to define the boundaries. And so we've actually been manually uh, mapping the, the rock outcrop um, and then overlaying the, 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 the classified boundaries between sediment uh, defined areas on top of that. So it's quite a, it's quite a tedious process. 
I'm very fortunate in that one of the most interesting aspects of the work we do in our team here in, in the Marine Institute is that we are an, an entirely multidisciplinary team. So in the team we have geophysicists, we have hydrographic surveyors, we have data processors, we have GIS analysts, we have geologists. Um, so we have an entire sort of small team, but a team of, of disparate uh, sciences and, and, uh, and expertise. Um, and when you put that together, it, it sort of, the, the suite of products that you can generate are much more diverse than if you're a, a group of single discipline scientists. And that's the whole concept of, of, of Infomar. The program itself uh, is, 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 is a, a word in title, but it's an acronym which stands for Integrated Mapping for the Sustainable Development of Ireland's Marine Resource. And that, that, that concept of integrated mapping brings in the whole multidisciplinary nature of the work that we do and that we support. Uh, in, recent, in recent years, uh, in the last two years in particular, We've been really focusing in on the value-added program development area. So whilst we're out acquiring data, we're mapping, we're generating products and data and services, now we're starting to work with industry, with businesses, with uh, innovation sectors to try and develop technology and business opportunities for people in Ireland to start to basically achieve products and new products and services for the Irish scientific and, and, uh, and commercial sector in, in the marine space.